Hey guys, thanks for uh, coming out to the meet today. Uh, we had a very small crowd. I think uh, just had Edward today and my son, uh, but we covered functions, right? So we uh, talked about functions in our last uh, video, uh, but today we actually covered it during our meetup. So I'm just going to go back over some of the things that we discussed. So it should be fairly quick um, and uh, we'll just jump right into it. So let me get my screen set up if I can figure out which button to hit. Uh, let's try that. There we go. All right. So functions. Why do we need functions? Right. So as our programs grow, as there are more and more and more lines that we write, we're going to find that our code becomes unmanageable at some point. Right. If we need to make a change to our code, we're having to make that change maybe in multiple places uh, because we're replicating uh, lines within our code. So the example I gave was we have a, uh, a game and in that game, uh, our characters are battling, right? And so I'm writing some functionality that simulates one character attacking another character. We have to determine if that that attack was successful. If so, maybe we decrement or reduce the health in the character that got damaged, right? Well, if there are multiple places uh, throughout my game where this battle takes place, I don't necessarily want to replicate that same code over and over again. Maybe it's like, oh, I copy out, you know, what worked before and I paste it in here so now I can do battle again. Instead, what I should do is take that battle functionality and kind of move it off on its own in a function, right? And then whenever I want two characters to do battle, I just call the battle function and I pass in my two characters. That way, if I ever need to make a change to how uh, a battle takes place, then I only have to change it in the battle function, right? I don't have to change it in multiple places in my code, just where I've written that battle function. And by doing that, my code shrinks because I don't have all this replicated code. It's easier to maintain that. Uh, when I look at it, I can see, okay, this function is just for battles, right? I don't have to look all across my code and see where there's some battle things taking place, right? Um, and so it's easier to reuse uh, my code if I want to write a new game and I already have bat battle functionality that I liked in another game, I could just bring in just that function, right? And so again, I can reuse my code. It's easier to read it. I'm not duplicating it. And then because I only have one place to change it, I can reduce errors in my code, right? Now, just like our battle that took place, I passed in two different characters. Those become arguments to my function, right? So I'm passing in those characters uh, and then my function utilizes those characters in some way, right? And so those are arguments into my function. So if I come here, I'll slide down one and we'll get our first look at what a function looks like. Now, again, I covered some of this in our previous uh, video, uh, but just to hit the high levels again. So just like in our for loops, just like in our if statements, the syntax is fairly similar. I have this colon here and I have some indentation that takes place, right? So in my function, all of these indented lines indicate to Python that these lines are part of this function, okay? So we have to have the colon here at the end, and then we have to indent the lines that are gonna be a part of that function. Now to start my function, I was just put DEF, so it's a short for define. So I'm defining my function. It's called random password, and I have two attributes that I'm passing in. I have character set and I have length, right? So fairly uh, small number of arguments going in, but the point is, is that I've defined a function, I've given it a name, 
I've determined which things I want to pass in, and then I write my actual function, right? So in this case, our random password function generates random passwords. So given a character set and the length of a password that I want, it goes ahead and it generates those. So I'm using a couple different things in the function, and this portion isn't um, too important that you completely understand this bit of code, but we'll go over it just because it's not too complicated, right? So first I check to see the length, right? So I'm expecting to get a string, and we'll talk about what this thing is right here, but I'm expecting it to get a string. So that string is probably multiple characters. And so that character set, I check to see if its length is greater than uh, zero. So in this case, if it's equal to zero, go ahead and return just an empty string, right? So essentially you didn't give me any characters. There's no password that I can generate from that. So I'll give you an empty uh, string back. So assuming that this was not true and I didn't return here, because whenever I hit a return, it basically jumps out of the function. So we have a return here. This would exit the function early or I have a return here at the bottom. So if I went all the way through my function, I would return from here. And so in essence, I'm building a list. So I have an empty list that I start with and then I'm going to loop through. So I have my for loop. This range takes an integer and it will return from zero all the way up to, but not including that integer. So in my case, I'm using 32 down here that I'm going to pass in. So it's going to generate zero, one, two, three, all the way up to 31. And then once it gets to 32, it exits out. So essentially this will loop 32 times, right? From zero to 31. That means I'm going to append 32 times to this password, All right? Now I'm using a function called choice and choice takes in an iterable, which is my character set. And it just randomly picks one thing from that set or from that iterable, right? And so I'll get a random character appended to my password during each loop, which means I get a random character that's appended 32 times because I said I want you to loop 32 times. And so now I get a 32 character password. And so my password has 32 characters in it and it's a list. I join those together and I return the result. So again, all it's going to do is take in the characters that I give it, the number of times that I want to loop, and it's going to return that, and I'm assigning it then to something called my password, and I'm going to print it out. So I think, given from our meetup, I probably still have, um, probably still have the code up. I believe if I exit out and I hit up, yep. So I do have my password function, All right? So I'm going to use the tack i for uh, Python 3. And this is just going to make it interactive. So it's going to run this. And then it's going to leave me with a REPL up. All right. So we notice here it ran it. And then it left me at a REPL. Okay. So it ran this random password function. It ran all of this code. That code generated, it called the random password, it assigned it, and then it printed it. So what I see here is the result of that print statement. But now I can call random password and I can give it the attributes it's expecting. So A, B, C, D, E. So that's now my character set. And let's say I want an eight character password. And so it generates an eight character password given that character set. 
C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. And now each time I call it, I should get a different randomly generated password given this character set and this length. If I were to increase that length, it would increase as well. Okay. So one of the things we also talked about in our functions is this thing right here. So notice length looks a little bit different than the character set does. There's this equals 16. And that's because essentially I am giving it a default value. So that if I don't provide a length when I call the function, it's going to automatically insert 16 as my length. So let's give that a try. So if I erase and turn off that, come back here. So instead of passing in 16, I don't pass in a length at all. I still get a 16 character password, right? And this just allows me to provide some defaults for, for my functions, okay? So nothing too tricky here. So again, all I'm doing is defining a function with that DEF. I'm giving the function a name. And then if I want to pass things into my function, I can do so. But there's no requirement for me to pass things in if my function that I'm you know, writing doesn't require it. So if I did something like this, DEF, say hello, and I don't want anything to go in, I just put in empty brackets, right? I hit enter. Because I'm in the REPL, it knows that because I provided the colon, it's expecting something after this, right? So I have to indent. So I just hit the tab key. So I'm now indented. So it knows the, the lines that I write here are going to be a part of the function. So I'll just put print hello. I can hit enter. Now, inside the REPL, I have to hit enter twice so it knows that I'm done with this function. And now I can just call our function, right? And it prints out exactly what I wanted. Maybe I want to say hello to someone. So I'll define a function. I'm going to overwrite uh, what I've already built. And I'll put in some type of name. I'll do a print. And here we'll have some type of print statement. I'll say, hello. We haven't talked about uh, some of this, the format methods, but essentially uh, what I have here is I have a function called say hello. It has one attribute called name. I'm going to take that. And this name ends up inserted right into those brackets. So again, this name, based on the format statement, gets inserted right there into those brackets. So the result is I print hello and the name. So let's give that a try. So I will say hello. And I'll pass in the string, Josh. And it says, hello, Josh, right? So same kind of things we saw before. I define a function with the def. I give the function a name, say underscore hello. Uh, I determine whether or not it should have attributes. In this case, I provide an attribute called name. And then I do something with that name, right? Now, in this case, there's no return statement from our function. Our say hello function doesn't return anything. However, what we'll find is that it does actually return something. It doesn't print out. But if I look at the type, it does have none type, meaning that our say hello function, because I didn't provide a return, it, it basically returned none. And that's Python's way of saying, hey, nothing, right? So there is a return even if I didn't specify it. But typically, 
it depends what you want your function to do. In the case of my random password, I returned the password that I generated. And so uh, in those um, in those things, it runs random password. Because of this return, what gets returned here gets assigned to my password. And then I just print it out. Okay. So nothing too complicated. But that's essentially functions for you, right? So if I go to the next one, the next slide, I'll notice there's some functionality here at the top that we didn't talk about. And this is the doc string. And this is a way for one programmer to provide some documentation to uh, other programmers who might utilize uh, your functions, right? So in my case, if we notice up here, I did some imports, right? So this is code that another programmer wrote. So somebody wrote this module called string. Somebody wrote a module called random. And inside that module, they wrote a function called choice, right? And so given that they wrote that code, I can look up help documentation on how to use that code, right? So if I go back in, I've already imported string because I'm in the REPL where I had I ran uh, my uh, password function. So if I do a help on string, I get all of the documentation that that programmer wrote. And these are things on how to utilize the uh, string module, all the things that are included in the string module. So we think see things like uh, ASCII letters, hex digits, uh, octal digits, punctuation. Well, I used some of those things in my function, right? So if we look here, I have string.ASCII letters, string.digits, right? All right, string.ASCII letters, string.digits. And so there's an explanation in the code what those things actually are. And if we go all the way to the bottom, we will find out that ASCII letters is actually uppercase and lowercase, you know, alphabetic letters for the English language. We see that digits is actually equal to the string from zero to nine. Okay. And so this, again, is documentation that that programmer wrote in order for me to know how to use their function. So we can do the same things. We can provide this at the top of our function and it's it becomes a doc string because I have this triple quote, right? And this triple quote, again, tells Python that the thing inside these triple quotes is a doc string and that becomes a part of the help documentation. So if I do a help on random, password, I'll find that the things I wrote in that doc string all show up for another programmer to use. And maybe it's even for me to remember, hey, when I wrote this, this is how I expected you know, it to be called. These are the things it's going to return, so on and so forth. So again, automatically built in documentation if you take the time to fill out this doc string, right? And so as you start coding more and more and you provide functions or modules for other programmers to use, it's just good to write some doc strings in there, right? Because this will help them use your code, right? So this is, this is good programmer etiquette, right? Okay, so that's it for functions. And now we'll go over some of the labs that we worked on. So the first thing we did was calling the functions, right? So if I go into uh, one of my editors here, so this is VS code, and I have calling functions up. I have main.py, and I included these in the uh, Discord channel so that you know uh, the students could work on it. But essentially, uh, we're gonna fill out anywhere where there's a comment. So in this case, it looks like 
this roll dice function has already been built. And the roll dice function just wants uh, some type of value to come into it, and then it's going to provide some type of output. Well, what does that look like? Well, number of dice, uh, my doc string says that that's going to be an integer value. Uh, number of sides, that's also going to be an integer value. And you should expect that I'm going to return to you a list, right? So in this case, our first comment says, call the roll dice function for three dice with six sides. So I have an empty list built here. We don't need that because this is going to um, return to us a list. I put it in there so that you know the code would at least run. It doesn't do anything at this point, but it does run. And so let's go ahead and replace these brackets with a call to our roll dice function. And notice here, VS code, it knows uh, that this is a Python function. It knows that this is a doc string. So notice here, it generated help documentation for me uh, that you know explains how to call the function. So again, nice to have a doc string in there. So it says I have to provide it two integers. So I'm going to say three, and I'm going to have for number of sides, I'm going to say it's a six-sided dice. Now we want to print our rolls. Okay, so I'm going to print rolls. And we'll go ahead and run it at that point. <clears throat> I should probably save it before I run it. And so what we see, well, I guess it automatically saved it earlier, but what we see is that I have three numbers returned, so our three dice, and I have values 2, 1, and 3 came back, right? So that's the number or the side value that came back. So we should expect that this will be a value between one and six. So we notice we ran it here before. We had four, six, and one. Now we have two, one, and three, right? So it'll always be a value from one to six because that's how many sides we uh, provided it. So let's go ahead and total each of the rolls. So we're going to call another function called sum. And in the sums help documentation, it says, hey, you're going to give me an iterable, and I'm going to provide back to you an integer. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So sum of roles. We'll go ahead and save that, run it. And what we see is that it did, in fact, determine the sum of our rolls. So we had three dice, came back four, one, and three. So four plus one is five, plus three is eight. Okay, if I hit the up arrow to run it again, I'll find that it did run it again, one, six, and one, and I came up with eight again. If I run it again, two, five, and four, and I get 11, right? So that's all we needed to do in this lab. We called our function, providing it the correct attributes that were asked for, three dice with six sides. We printed that so we could see these are the uh, numbers I actually rolled. And then we added them up, right? And then we played around during the lab uh, with you know additional values, additional dice, um, so that we could see that now that we've written this function, all we have to do is call it, provide it different values, and we get different results. Okay, moving on. Our next one was writing a function, right? So this one was more challenging. This one required you to think uh, like a, you know, just problem solve, right? You don't even have to think as a programmer. You just have to first solve a problem. And then now that we've figured out how to solve it, we'll translate that into code, right? And so a lot of a programmer's job is just problem solving. You're given something to do, you have to figure out how to come up with a result and then translate that into some type of code. That's probably the hardest part is figuring out how to solve it. The easier part typically is now, how do I take that and put that into code, right? 
But the, the biggest thing is you need to be able to solve problems, right? So here we have a function that we're going to write that has to determine whether a character is a vowel, right? And so in this case, I'm going to bring in a single character and I should return some type of bool, either true or false, whether it's a vowel or not, right? So A, E, I, O, U coming in. Uh, those are what we're going to say are vowels, right? And we understand that sometimes Y is considered a vowel, but to keep it simple, we'll say that A, E, I, O, U are vowels. Anything that's not that is not a vowel, right? Okay, so if we look down here, we have a comment here that says, hey, we're going to first have to get some input from a user, and then we're going to have to write this function to do something with that, right? And so we talked about during the meetup that there's a way for uh, Python to get uh, input from the user, and that's with the input function. So VS Code is nice to bring up the help documentation, but the first thing I'm going to provide it uh, is a prompt, and what it's going to return is a string. So let's build my prompt. Uh, please give me some input. And I'll put a colon space just because it's nice to have some uh, nice formatting here. So this input function is going to prompt our user for some input. Once they provide that input, it's going to then return that string. And I'm assigning it now to user input. I'm going to loop across that user input, meaning that character by character, it's going to return that. So let's say uh, my user provided the value test, right? So I'm going to loop across that and I'm going to provide T, E, S, T. So character by character. Now I'm going to take that character or that letter and I'm going to pass it to my isVal function. If this results in a return of true, I print this out, right? It is a vowel. If is val returns false or anything that's not true, right? I'm going to print out is not a vowel, all right? Now, currently, I have this pass thing in my function. This essentially is a no op, no operation. It does nothing. So you can call is val, but is val does nothing with it. So let's give that a try. So if I click this, Python runs my uh, function. It says, please give me some input. And I will type in test. I'll hit enter. And notice here we did loop across each letter T E S T. But because is val doesn't return anything at this point, this never results in a true, so I always print out is not a val, right? So each one says it's not a val. So what happens if I were to return true? I'll save that, run it. Oops, let me move down here. Test, notice, because I returned true, isVal always results in a true now. And so now it thinks every character is a val. Okay? So that's a hint to us that we need to be returning true anytime we want this to print and return something other than true if we want this to print. Okay? So we need to do a comparison of the letter that comes in to see if it's equal to one of those things. And if so, go ahead and return true. So we solved this during our meetup in, in multiple different ways, right? As you're problem solving, you may find multiple avenues to come to something that works, right? And after you've figured out how to solve it multiple times, you might go back and look at those and figure out 
this one is the most efficient way of doing it or maybe this one might not be as efficient but it's really easy to see what it's doing so for the next time i have to look at this function or modify it it's easier for me to do it and if i share this code with somebody else it's easy for them to also see what it's doing like i could come up with a super super efficient way of doing it but it's really hard to tell what it's doing and so it makes it harder on the next programmer okay so there are trade-offs for the different ways that we do it but the important part is we come up with a way and then we build code to do that thing right so the first way we're just going to do it very simply if our letter is equal to a return true all right i have the colon because this is an if i have indentation that says hey if this is true return this and we could do else turn false i'll save that i'll run it this time i'm going to pass in apple because apple has an a and i'll see that it does in fact say a is a vowel and everything else is not a vowel obviously e is still a vowel but we never checked for that up here so we could say or letter is equal to e i'll save that run it run apple and it does say a is a vowel and e is a vowel right and the rest are not and we could continue this on for each of the different characters or letter is equal to uh, i or letter is equal to o or letter is equal to u save that and if i provide some input some input if i slide up here so we can see more of this it'll say s is not a vowel, but O is a vowel. M is not a vowel, but E is a vowel. The space in between our two words is not a vowel. I is a vowel, N, P, U is a vowel, and then T, right? So it's working, right? And this would be one way in which we could solve it. But what we'll find is that it doesn't always work the way we think. What if I capitalized? Apple. Now suddenly A is no longer a vowel. And that's because what we are matching on, what we're looking for is a lowercase a. So again, now we have a, a problem we need to solve. How do we make sure? Well, I could come back in here and also do or letter equals capital A, right? And so now this is going to double in size because we have to check to make sure each of those work for capital letters another way that we could do that is letter equals letter dot lower so what we'll find if i bring up this remember how we used the dir uh, before to find out all the different things that we could do with various data types and stuff like that so if i pass in a letter what i will find is that I can convert them to lowercase. And I could even do help on that. So I'll do a dot lower. And I'll find out the lower returns a copy of the string converted to lowercase. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that letter, converting it to lowercase, and then I'm assigning it back to letter. So that when I do my checks here, letter will always be lowercase. And so if I save and I run, this time I'll capitalize Apple again. And it does in fact work. A is now a vowel again. Okay. So again, this is one way in which we could solve it. 
there are other ways in which we could solve this. So I'm having to do all of these different checks. What would happen if instead of doing all these different checks, I took this, I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to say vowels equals, I'm going to paste that in. And instead of checking each and every one of those, I'll say if letter in vowels. So first, it's going to, there's this special in keyword for Python, and it's going to say, hey, if this thing you're giving me is in this other thing, if that results in true, I'm going to return true. And so if we save and run, it does in fact work. So A is still a vowel, P, L are not vowels, and E is a vowel, right? So that worked just like we wanted to. So again, a different way of solving it. But then again, there's some... Redundancy probably isn't the right word here, but if you notice here, if this results in true, return true. So it's like we're doing that true thing twice. If it's true, return true. How about we just return that? Because that's going to return true or false. Additionally, this else statement is kind of redundant too, right? If this is true, return true, otherwise return false. Well, anytime you hit a return statement, it automatically stops running this function and returns that value. So I could have done something like that. Let me put a space in there so it's a little easier to see. So if letter in vowels, if this is true, go ahead and return true. Well, if this return never runs, it'll go down to the next line here and it will return false. So this should also work. Oop, misspelled apple. Probably been misspelling apple. Anyway. Um, it still works. Yeah, I've been misspelling. It's Apple. I think it's because it's so big on my screen. I haven't even noticed that I've been spelling it wrong the whole time. If I run this, A-P-P-L-E. Sorry. A is a vowel. P is not a vowel. L is a vowel. E is a vowel, right? So this works. So this setup works, but again, we're checking to see if this is true, return true, otherwise return false. Well, if this is always gonna gener generate a true or false, let's just return that instead. So instead of all of this, we get rid of that, and we'll say return letter in vowels. So this, is going to uh, become true or false, and that's what I'm going to return. So I run that, and it does in fact work, right? So A is a vowel, P is not a vowel, and it should work for uh, uppercase characters as well, because that didn't change. So everything still works. And this is a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit cleaner. And that's, again, one is not better than the other unless this may be more efficient. Now I'm not have to test something and then drop to the next line and then return that thing. I can just return the results of that initial test. Um, so again, multiple ways of solving it. Um, so whatever works better for you in your code, what whatever makes it a little bit more readable, that's, that's what's important, right? Okay.
So we're going to wrap it up there. Um, that is functions for you. Obviously, the examples we used were fairly easy, fairly straightforward. Um, but you can get them as complicated as you need them to be. But the whole point is, is that we want to uh, reduce the amount of code that we're going to use multiple times, right? So in our battle example, I don't want to have to write a uh, some battle code multiple places. I want to write it in one place, and then I just want to call that battle function anytime I need it. In our case, we didn't want to have to write this test multiple times down here. Instead, I just call isVal anytime I need to use it, right? In our uh, random password one, uh, if I needed to generate uh, multiple passwords, I don't need to replicate that uh, the code that made the password multiple times. I just need to call generate password anytime I need it to generate a password, okay? And that helps clean up my code. It makes it more, uh, you know, streamlined. Uh, and it makes it so that I only have to make fixes in one place. If later I find out that, oh, I forgot to take into consideration that capital letters wouldn't work, I don't have to change that in multiple places. I only have to go to this one isVal function and add this one line in here. And now anytime I call isVals, it has that fix. Okay. So again, uh, I appreciate uh, you coming out today. Uh, I hope this was uh, useful uh, to some of you guys uh, and gals. And uh, I look forward to our next meetup. So thanks for watching.